Sollen wir loslegen? Okay, dann uh, hello, welcome um, here at the Kunsthaus Dahlem for the talk by Lisa Hilli. My name is Lisa Marei Schmidt. I'm the director of the Brücke Museum and I'm very happy to be introducing Lisa Hilli here today. Unfortunately, the curator Pas Guevara, who curated this exhibition at Kunsthaus Dahlem, um, is uh, not able to make it today due to the extreme weather conditions. Um, therefore, I have the honor to introduce Lisa and to welcome the audience here uh, to, to, um, and the audience online to this event. And we decided prior to this event that Lisa will be giving a presentation of her work around 40 minutes and there will be a, um, a chance for questions afterwards. Lisa Hilly is an artist and scholar who is based in Melbourne, Australia. She is a descendant of the Tolai people of Papua New Guinea and holds an MFA by research from, Royal Mel from the Royal Melbourne Institute for Technology. She's a member of Powerhouse Museum um, of the Powerhouse Galang, an international indigenous think tank for the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney, as well as of the Oceania, Oceania Working Party for the Australian Dictionary of Biography. And currently she is a PhD researcher at the Australian National University. The focus of her PhD is on the visual representation of Papua New Guinean women through um, photography and filmmaking, um, which we will speak more about in her presentation. We are very happy that her artistic work is not only presented here at the exhibition in Kunsthaus Dahlem, but that she is also one of the critical contemporary voices that we included in our exhibition at the Brücke Museum, um, the exhibition Whose Expression, which is a cooperation with the Stedelijk Museum and the Statens Museum in Copenhagen. Currently, Lisa is an international fellow at the German Maritime Museum um, at the Leibniz Institute for Maritime History in Bremerhaven, exploring the movement of Asian and Pacific bodies on German ships during the colonial area. We are very happy, like even due to the storm, you can be with us here today. And I hand over the microphone. Hello. Hello. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I'll, I will be speaking in English today. I don't speak Deutsch, unfortunately. Um, thank you for the introduction, Lisa. Um, it's really, really wonderful to be here. Um, where to start? So I was invited by Paz to contribute to this exhibition, um, Transitions. And I chose to, let me just go the first. I'm doing this completely imp improvised because the plan was to have a chat with Paz. <laughs> so, just, so just bear with me. Um, okay. So this is the work that I've made for the show, which is just up there at the top. Um, so I'm referring to them as archival interventions, which is something that I've worked on for the last few years of my arts practice. So maybe I'll just do like a quick overview of, of how, I've, how I've worked as an artist. And I first started sort of working with museum collections in about 2010, when I discovered a, um, a cultural body adornment item that belongs to my people that we made called a uh, midi. And um, I realized that my mother didn't know what this was and no one in my, not many people in my community knew that what this was and it was a culturally devalued item um, due to colonial and religious impacts um, in Papua New Guinea. And so that's kind of where my museum uh, creative work started, it was looking at cultural objects, objects that were related to colonialism and now exist in museums. And so this particular item, Midi, does not is not no longer made, and there is no of none of these items in Papua New Guinea, and they all only exist in museums outside of Papua New Guinea. And I'm sure there's dozens of them here in Germany. Um, so, my my practice is anchored in photography. Uh, I it's I call it my first love. It's where I started with, and um, I. I'm working on these images as part of my PhD. Um, and I started with the top series. Um, 
And the image is from a Catholic missionary uh, archival book that the Catholic missionaries created. And so in Rabaul, Vunapope, which is where I was born. So Vunapope in my language means place of the Pope. Uh, that was the first successful Catholic mission in all of Papua New Guinea. Um, so I like to affectionately refer to myself as a mission baby. <laughs> and I found this image in this book and the, the caption of this image, the top image of the scenery of the island, and it's called Scenic View of New Britain, which is the post-German colonial name for the island. It used to be called New Pomern, now it's New Britain. Today it's East New Britain. Um, but that's not what my people call it. <laughs> and so I was looking at this image and it, it, it just it sparked something for me in terms of the first time I actually started to... I, the first time I actually questioned the validity of Western namings, Western naming conventions to my homelands. And this, the, what it says here in English is the same thing in Tokpisin, uh, pigeon English, which is a plantation language that evolved out of the German plantation history in the Pacific. And then it's my language, which is a tinata tuna. Uh, so I, these are the three languages that I grew up with in my home that I heard every day. And so it says, at eight years old, I didn't believe that my island was called New Britain. This is true. <laughs> and so as a little girl, I used to write to my bubble, my grandmother, my mum's mum. And I used to write her letters when that was the only way to communicate <laughs> before, you know, internet. And so I asked my mum what the address was and everything in my grandmother's address was in our, ind in our Indigenous language until we got to the province. And it was, and she said, oh, it's called East New Britain. And I s we had a massive argument and I just said, that's not what, that's not what it's called. I don't believe you because I'd learned in, you know, in school that... You know, East New Britain is like very related to the British. British, it's a British word, and I just didn't believe her. We had this massive argument, and I, I feel like that was the day I became, you know, I realised that you're allowed to refuse naming conventions of places where you were born. And I thought that was really amazing that I had that as a child at eight years old. And so that's what that work's about. <laughs> it's about a story and a memory that I had um, of, you know, the, the act of refusal and it happened between my mother and myself. Um, the next set of images um, is, um, again, in three different languages. So we've got in English, um, Unser Deutsch. I don't know how familiar you guys are with Unser Deutsch. It's a Creole, it's the only German Creole language, and it evolved out of Wunapope Mission, where I was born, and it was, uh, so when the Catholic bishops came to Rabaul in Papua New Guinea, any mixed race children that they found, because the German planters were there, you know, um, producing copper for, for the German colony, they had a lot of children. <laughs> and so a lot of these men didn't always stay. And so the bishops rounded up the children, took them into the mission. And so the Catholic approach to indoctrinate Papua New Guinean people, particularly in Rabaul, was to take the children and, and assimilate the children. And so because the children were removed from their families, they essentially created their own language, which was a mixture of German, Tokpisin, and, and uh, yeah, that was it. It was those two. So the middle language is Unser Deutsch, and it says, Eine Kind von Rabal, so it's a child of Rabal. And the last, the last uh, text image is, um, it's, in, it's in Deutsch. And I got some help from the staff to make sure I translated that correctly um, by Francisca, who was here earlier. And it's um, for the time being, just for the time being. And so the context of this image is that the man, the European man, is um, Governor Hull, Albert Hull. And he was the second governor of Rabaul in, in the German colony. And so he essentially created Rabaul. Like, he was the one that actually was, like, kind of, I guess, the architect behind it. And he did it illegally. He didn't actually get the permission of... of um, the imperial powers to actually build that town, but he did. And then they came over and said, yeah, that's okay. And that's a Tolai woman, so that's a woman from my community. And I saw this image many times when I, when I do archival research. And this image is actually from the State um, Ethnology Museum here in Berlin. 
and it's captioned Albert Hull and his Tolai wife and child, <laughs> and it really pissed me off <laughs> because it's like she had a name and she had a story. She has a story, and Albert Hull uh, actually published his memoir of his time in 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 Rabaul, um, which was the capital of German New Guinea, and he he's quite young in this image, and in his memoirs he completely erases her. There is no trace of her story, even though they had a child together, and he only talks about his European wife. And so recently, quite recently, um, I, I found um, something in um, a historical book of Rabaul, and it said that because there were so few women, European women, in the, in the Rabaul colony, um, German men who were sort of trying to build their status um, often took local women as wives and had children with them. And, but once they'd sort of, you know, built a name for themselves and kind of elevated through the ranks, because in this image, he was just a judge. He wasn't quite the governor yet. And so once they'd actually acquired these positions of status, they discreetly returned their wives to their villages with the children. And then the bishops came along and took the children and put them into Wunderpope, and that's how the Unser Deutsch community exists today. And a lot of those descendants live in Brisbane, and I have a lot of strong, um, I have a, a beautiful relationship with them, and so it's, um, that's just a little bit of history about Albert Hull. And so one of the elders in my community, Gideon Kakabin, did a lot of research, and um, found her name, and so we found her name, and so her name is Yawara Wakai. And um, a few years ago, my mum and a lot of the women in my community was asking, they said, who is this woman, who is this woman? They wanted to know who she was. And so no one still really knows who she is, and um, the, the best that I can do for now is actually just name her. I've requested the State um, Ethnology Museum here in Berlin to actually update their caption because it's digitally, you can look at it online, it's there, and it's still labelled as his wife. And so this is just me essentially asserting who she is and just, you know, um, humanising her because, you know, historically a lot of Indigenous people were dehumanised. And so that's, um, that's what that work is about. And... I, I often question, I put the Unser Deutsch language in there because I just wondered if it was children like this that eventually became that part of that community. Um, I won't talk too much longer about the last work. It, this is more about, um, these are just, these are, these are my language names for my homeland. It's, it's all about the volcano, it's about the ocean. Um, today it's known as Rabal, but it was actually called Rababal, which means many mangroves, but because of the translation with Germans, it, um, it got shortened to just rebel, which means the mangrove. And what's interesting is that the Germans actually asked my people to clear the mangroves away so they could build a port for the ships to come in. And so the mangroves are no longer there. <laughs> so the only thing that exists of the mangrove is actually the name. Um, in the middle is um, all of the names of the volcanoes. Rebel is a very volcanic active island, and they're a part of our... Um, Matrilineal cosmologies, and so my community are a matrilineal society, and so we follow the ancestry of women, and women and land are tied together. So women inherit land, it's always about women. And so the volcanoes, we refer to them as the mother and the daughters. And so there's two volcanoes that are still active today in Rabaul. Um, so, and this is essentially the, 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 the name of the whole work that I made, Rabaul Rakaya Natar, which is Rabaul, the mangroves, Rakaya, the volcanoes, Natar, the, the deep ocean. That's, that's what the work's about. Um, so, um, how come that's not showing up? The next, the next work I'm going to talk about is a, a red beaded installation. And we're just going to try and get this sorted. Um, I've always been interested in sites of transformation and so uh, places where cultures kind of collide and transform and shift and because I've worked in museums for such, I've also worked in museum for many years as well as being an artist um, so I got to access a lot of um, historical collections from Papua New Guinea and one of the first visits I had to a museum collection in Sydney, 
I found these um, middies, which are these shell collars, but they were com made completely of glass beads. And so, um, and so um, I was really curious to know, like, how did the beads get there? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know how beads got there in terms of, like, how did they get in the work? How did they get, how, it was just, it was like a complete um, unknown to me. And that was many, many years ago. And I started, res it, it was something that I didn't, I wasn't able to look into initially, but then I, when I had time and I finished my master's, I started doing more research into the history of um, trade beads. And so, so the image I'm looking at <laughs> is, is an installation um, that I did in 2018. Yeah, shall I pause? Take a small break. Yeah. So, and so then we can fix this up. I can look at your... Yeah, We're back. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Okay, uh, value systems. So I found out that um, I found out that through this missionary's journal. Um, so there were two missionary, uh, two religious faiths that came into Rabaul: the Catholic and then the Methodist missionaries, which were linked to Australia and, and London. And there was this pioneer missionary who. Um, who transcribed my language. And um, I read his journals to try and understand how he did it and just understand like the thinking behind translating a language and how missionaries learning languages was about teaching, you know, capturing the souls of people in terms of like with religion. But also they were, they were, they were also indigenizing themselves with actually learning indigenous languages. Um, and I read in his journal that he um, ordered 20 pounds of red glass beads from Sydney. And so if you know your shipping history, which I know a lot more about now, um, you, uh, Sydney was a major port for European vessels um, to stop over, get supplies, and then go out into the Pacific. And so the colonisation of the Pacific could not have happened without the colonisation of Australia. And so Sydney was a really integ integral point for um, stopover, and then things got, you know, back and forth. And yeah, 20 pounds is about nine kilograms of red beads, and it was specifically red beads that he requested. And I realised that, and through other research, that beads were like this really important colonial mechanism in order to build rapport with people. And the missionaries used it, so they would come in and they'd put necklaces, red, red necklaces over, um, over women and children to build rapport. And I thought that was really fascinating <laughs> because it was, you know, if you look at collections all over the world, I mean, just behind us, you've got African objects that are made of beads. And so, you know, if you think about colonialism historically, the Pacific was kind of like one of the last places to be colonised. And so they already sort of colonised Africa, or like with Asia and the Americas. And so there were all of these ways to actually build this rapport with Indigenous people through materiality. And that's what I was really interested in, because if you think about it historically, when two different cultures come together, they can't speak the same language. So how do you communicate? <laughs> and so it was through materiality. And so through my master's research, I, I sort of, you know, came to this, um, uh, I guess, opinion that materiality was the first language because I also read that um, a Russian anthropologist, Nikolai McClujo McClay, um, he um, threw red pieces of ribbon into the ocean. So upon arriving in Papua New Guinea, because he was like the very first anthropologist in Papua New Guinea and one of the probably most, most humane, um, so much so that New Guinea people actually named him the man and the moon man or something like that. So there was a beautiful relationship there. And so he often threw red ribbons into the ocean to kind of build that trust and rapport. And then a lot of colonists did the same thing after him. And so this isn't the complete image, um, but this image is by the same reverend whose journal I, I read about the glass beads. And the full image um, shows... Uh, it focuses on this harbour and the reverend who took this photo s captioned the image, the site of the first missionary and the first mission. And that was in August in 1875. And so 
when I, saw, when I found this image, I thought, oh, wow. So he came in on the steamer in this particular harbour, which is um, today called Duke of York Islands, in my language, but it's known as Miyoko, Miyoko Nata. Um, and that was the site. And so Reverend George Brown came in with Fijian men, catechists, and they sang on the steamer for three days and three nights before they came on shore and then started singing, and then that's how religion started. So this was the site. And in the background, you can actually see it's like that's the first mission church that was built, and it was based on Fijian design, and I only just found that out recently. But the focus of the image isn't on the women. The focus is on the actual history of the first missionary, and so what I wanted to do was just shift the focus back to the women because the women are just kind of like props in the image. Nobody knows their name. I asked community if they knew them. No one. And so... I basically was just reinserting the history that actually happened and at the same time refocusing it back onto women because women are always overlooked in, in archives and history and if you're a black woman, even more so. So um, that was just a little, an, another kind of intervention. So they're actually glass beads that I actually stitched into the photograph um, and they actually hang right below the frame. So it's a framed work and so the beads actually break the frame. So there's a lot of kind of messing with the image and sort of really... Breaking the rules of photography. Um, so that image there is, um, it's a, it's a Tolle um, man of status and he's wearing a midi. And that one, I, don't, it's, I know it's a small image, but if you can see that there's white, so they're all beads. That actual object is made of, entirely of beads. And then he's got his two wives below and they're wearing beads as well. So this is, this is just a detail of the installation that I made and... There's also forms of currency hanging on the bead installation. So um, there's currency from, there's, there's actually German marks in this, in this installation. There's British um, shillings, and then there's the Papua New Guinea Kina, which is still used today. And so there are all these kind of currency systems. And the other thing with plantation history is plantation workers were paid in beads. And so every, uh, cop, every basket, a palm basket, they would, you know, fill it up and then they'd weigh it, the, the local labourers, and for every pound of copper, you got given a thimble full of beads. So that's how labourers were paid on the plantations. So there's a lot of history. There's a lot of history. So I was really questioning... The, the work's called value systems because there's all these different systems of values that were going on during the German colonial era and it's... Um, it just wanted to show the history visually and... Tell, show people a, a different history that isn't always known. Um, so this, just finishing up on this work, this, so this is a whole body of work I made in 2018. Um, this is the Lord's Prayer in my language, and this was transcribed by the same reverend that I um, looked into his journal, and um, what's interesting is there's a lot of there's a lot of phonetics in there, and it's actually, it's, the language has changed today. Um, and so, because the missionaries came from Fiji and they'd already learnt the Fijian language, they brought these Fijian influences in terms of phonetics and pronunciations into my language. And so, with this text, uh, with this work, I was essentially just questioning how can you even, how can anyone who's not a native speaker transcribe someone else's language correctly? Like, is it possible? And, yeah, the only reference to sort of giving it away is the Lord's Prayer is just the word amen. I've sort of formatted it so it's exactly like the Lord's Prayer and I actually know the Lord's Prayer off by heart <laughs> because I was raised religious. Um, so it was just kind of unpacking all of this religious history, colonial history in, in this whole body of work. Um, so that's the full image. And this is another, this is a video work and I did like a reenactment of plantation labour um, in Rabaul, so I went back and filmed it. Um, okay, I'm just going to have a drink. How much time have I got? <laughs> 30 minutes? 30 minutes? Yeah, okay, I'll speak for another 10 minutes. I just want to see what else... Okay, yeah, all right. I'll talk really quickly about this work. So this is a commissioned work for the um, Institute of Modern Art in Brisbane. 
Um, it's called Sisterhood Lifeline. And um, I made this work as a response to institutional racism. I worked in a museum for four years and it was the most unhealthiest place I've ever worked. <laughs> Um, for my for my soul, my mind, my body, and my spirit, and it just yeah, uh, I had to get out, so I did, and I'm really happy now. <laughs> um, and I found that the only people I could really relate to, and actually who understood the difficulties, the difficult how difficult it is to work inside an institution when you're, I guess you know, a woman of color, um, is the importance of having your sisterhood and. I spent a lot of time calling friends, um, talking about the difficulties of working in an institutional space. And the museum that I worked at, I was the only Melanesian woman out of 400 staff. And so I got pulled in every direction. <laughs> and if you think about, if you know much about Melanesia, in Papua New Guinea alone, there's 800 different languages, 1,000 different cultural groups. Vanuatu, like there's another 300. West, West Papua, there's another 200 languages on top of that. And that doesn't even include the Solomon Islands, Timor-Leste, Fiji, um, Kanak people of New Caledonia. That's Melanesia. And so I wanted to create a work that just where black women could just take up institutional space. That was what the work was about. Um, but it was, but it was also about refusal because these, these spaces where black women women of colour, indigenous women in Australia held a lot of supportive space for me when I was having a lot of difficulty. And this is actually, <laughs> I actually recreated my office cubicle. <laughs> this is my office cubicle. <laughs> and so um, in the telephone, I recorded people's stories about um, their experiences of working in a museum and what actually helped them and that whole talking process actually healed a lot of people to be able to share their story and just to have people to listen to it. And I also encouraged people to leave a note for the sisterhood. And so it was about, you know, writing notes of empowerment because that's how I survived. Like I just had to create a really supportive space for me whilst working in that space. Um, and so the women, the two women that I photographed, um, it's um, Nimila Benson on, in the green. That's so she's Tolai, so she's my, from my community, and Chantelle um, Weatherall. And she's a um, she doesn't actually know the origin of her history because of the history of you know slavery with Africans. So, um, but they, these were two very um, supportive women for me. So that's 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 what that work was about. Um, so this is the most, I guess, one of the most recent commissions that I've made, and it was for the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. Um, it's the FMI Sisters. And I, I um, Australian military history is very much white male dominated, and Australians only tell very successful war, like war stories. and. I mean, the fact that we have a museum dedicated to our war history speaks volumes. And so I wanted to focus on, um, again, women's history, um, Papua New Guinea women's history, because no one had actually really looked at it. And I, I went to Rabaul and just did a Google search, Papua New Guinea women's Second World War, because that was the focus. And um, found this really amazing little known story about the FMI sisters. And they uh, kept European and Australian missionaries and civilians alive for three years under Japanese occupation in Raval. And that history had been sitting there in the archives for 75 years. And um, these are the sisters from Vunapope. So they, they were, you know, um, it was again from the Catholic mission. Um, and I spoke to the archivists from, F, from the... Um, Catholic convent. So FMI is um, Fele Maria Immaculata, which means Daughters of Mary Immaculate. So that's their convent name. I learned a lot about Catholic history. <laughs> I don't know anything about Catholic. I didn't know anything when I went there. So I asked a lot of dumb questions to the, to the sisters <laughs> about Catholic um, 
No, so I was like, what, what do you guys do all day? I just had no idea. <laughs> and um, I had to do a complete flip on my understanding of the church and not just being, not just being uh, an institution that came in and destroyed and fractured my culture because that's, that was the perspective I came in with. And then after I spoke to a lot of the women who were sisters and still living today, I realised that the Catholic Church was a, a space for emancipation in terms of Indigenous patriarchy. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, whoa. I <laughs> had to sit in front of this sister and actually completely do a flip in terms of like, I, I, my views were just actually completely wrong. And that was not easy. Like I had to sit there in that discomfort and not challenge her, not question her, because she just said to me very assertively, I had no desire to have children or get married. And I'd never heard anyone in my community say that. And it was a Catholic nun. <laughs> and so I was like, oh my God, I've found feminism in my community. <laughs> and it's in the Catholic church. I, didn't, I just no, didn't did not think it would be there. So, um, this is the prisoner of war camp. It's called Romale. And so, behind the women are um, Australian soldiers that kind of liberated the camp on September 14th, 1945, end of World War II. And these women grew pod produce. That's what they did. That's how they kept them alive. Because when the Japanese came into Rabaul, um, I think it was January 1943, it was an Australian territory because the Australians came in, basically took over Rabaul, uh, took over German New Guinea. Um, that was in World War One, and so it was it was then an Australian territory, and so essentially Australia got invaded. Australians put. Um, Australian women and children on boats and evacuated them, left a lot of the Asian people there and all of the Indigenous people there. So essentially, they just had to, everyone had to fend for themselves. But if you know, I don't know how much you guys know about Second World War history. Um, what I found in my research was that the Japanese emperor, uh, Emperor Hirohito, he viewed Second World War as the sacred war. And so it was about liberating... Asian and Pacific people from Western imperialism whilst asserting Japanese <laughs> imperialism. So it wasn't really, you know, and so um, essentially all Indigenous people were free to roam. So all of the European and Australians got locked up, like basically rounded up and put into these internment camps, which is, this is what one of them were. And so all of the Catholic missionaries and civilians um, were held here um, for two to three years. And because it's in a valley, these women had to walk up this steep hill every single day with produce, carrying produce on their backs. The Japanese would check it, they would take all the food that they wanted, and then they'd walk back down this hill into the valley to feed, and they would just leave the food for the missionaries. And, and then, you know, so they essentially risked their lives every single day to keep these missionaries alive. And I didn't quite understand why they did it, and then I thought about it, and I just thought, well, you know, the Japanese said to them, no, you can't worship, you can't practice your faith, you know, you don't have to practice this Western religion, you can, you're free, you can do whatever you want. And, they were, and they were, the sisters were like, no, we love our God, <laughs> we're actually going to continue to um, practice this faith. And I just thought that's, that's autonomy, like that's, 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 that's what they were doing, they were just expressing their autonomy, whether or not people believe it was right or wrong, it's like, I think it's about agency and it's allowing people to choose what they want to practice and what sort of faith they you know, what things that they want to do. And so I wanted to try and um, create like this, um, I guess, uh, what's the word? Um, I wanted to centre them because this is the only photo I found of them in the archives together and it actually just happened to be in the camp. And I wanted to somehow incorporate the, the nationalities of all the different civilians. And there was about 300 civilians and all of the flowers represent the different nations um, of those civilians. So if you know the history of flowers <laughs> and nations, and you may recognize some, and so cornflowers for Germany. <laughs> um, and then we've got um, the Irish uh, shamrock. Then there's, the, there's, the, there's tulips from Amsterdam, or Netherlands. Um, there's... Um, uh, what else? There's Belgian poppies. 
there's English rose, there's French iris, Austrian edelweiss, uh, Swedish twin flower. Um, so the marigold, not Indian, Native American. <laughs> okay, it's because the American national flower is a rose. Roses are not indigenous to America. So I went, I went to that level of like connecting plants, lands back to, um, to people. Um, and then there's the Japanese cherry blossom and a Korean hibiscus. Um, so when the Japanese came to Rabaul, they also set up um, comfort stations. And so they brought a lot of women, like female prostitutes. It, wasn't, it was not uncommon across military. The Japanese did it. And so a lot of Korean and Okinawa women were brought to Rabaul into work in brothels. And they did it so that the Japanese wouldn't, would leave the, the, the native women alone. But that didn't happen. And so there's this hidden history of Asian women in my homelands that is just appalling. And I actually went to the site of where these brothels were. And um, a lot of the Korean and women from Okinawa were not told where they were going and what they were doing. So it was just horrendous. Like they just had no agency or choice over what they had to do for the men, Japanese men. And so uh, if you want to know more about that, go look up a film called Senso Daughters. It's by a female Japanese filmmaker, um, Noriko Seguchi. Um, I think she's still alive. She's pretty low profile. It's not an easy film to watch. It's a documentary. She interviews a lot of Papua New Guinea women and a lot of Japanese service people as well about that history. It's, it's really hard, hard history, but important to acknowledge. And so I wanted to include them in this work because that's, that's what Papua New Guinea people do. We don't exclude anyone. We're always about including everyone. Like we just, we don't, we're not, that's the kind of people we are. And that's what I wanted to show in this work is that the humanity of Papua New Guinea people that I know is not shown visually. It's not portrayed. And these women did what they did out of, you know, acts of, of love and service and faith and courage. How many stories do you hear about Papua New Guinea women being portrayed like that? None. <laughs> like, it's always like we're victimised and we're getting, you know, uh, we're getting beaten up by the men and there's rape and like witchcraft. Like that's all you hear. And it's, that is not the Papua New Guinea that I know. That is not the Papua New Guinea women that I know, that I grew up with and that, you know, who held me and, you know, really nurtured me. And so just wanted to completely shift the narrative that Papua New Guinea women are awesome and PNG Catholic nuns are awesome. <laughs> so I also made these um, textile works to go with the commission. So these are the cinctures. So these are the black uh, ribbons that kind of go around their waist. And I ended up finding their names. <laughs> I found their names. I found about 40 names. There was 45 sisters all together and I found 40 of their names. And so I hand stitched all their names into these cinctures um, and just to honor them. And so this work is in the collection of the National um, uh, Australian War Memorial. Yeah, and I'm just gonna finish up real quick about my um, fellowship research with the German Maritime Museum. Um, as Lisa said, I was really interested in the um, movement of Asian and Pacific bodies and German ships. So I looked, real, uh, I looked into the German Samoa plantations and I found that there's a lot of Melanesian stories that are not documented around Melanesian laborers that came back to Rabaul and their experiences because, just to give you some quick stats, around 7,000 Melanesian laborers were taken to German Samoa in between like 1863 to 1902, and a lot of them didn't come back. And so what happened is there was a small community then that again kind of formed in, in Samoa called the Tamo Uli and Tiene Uli, which is black man, black woman. And they still experience a lot of racism today in Samoa. So there is a lot of internalized colorism that exists within the Pacific. So Melanesians are kind of like down the bottom because we're the, we're the darkest. <laughs> and then it's Micronesians and then Polynesians. And so um, it's really taboo to say that. <laughs> it really is. Um, and I found through my community, through consultation just on social media because I couldn't do research there, um, that there were a lot of hidden oral stories in the songs 
that are, that are still sung today, these contemporary songs. So I made a playlist of songs, and a lot of these songs are called Abot, and they're all they're, they're songs about people who journeyed on boats far away, and, and then those songs have just been passed down intergenerationally. And so you can look and just search YouTube, go into YouTube, I've created a playlist, and it's just called Abot, A-B-O-T, and yeah, if you understand Tokpisin, um, Pidgin English or my language. Most of the songs are in, in Tokpisin, which is the plantation language. So it's really interesting that they sing these songs in the plantation language. Um, yeah, you, you might get an insight as to what that history is about. And I, I think it's really important that Pacific people tell Pacific history their way. And um, this is a, a, an undocumented piece of history that's, um, that still exists today and it's still being sung. And so... Yeah, that's, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I know I've spoken and shared a lot, but please ask yeah, anything that you want to know further. Thank you. How do I start? Kannst du es hier reinsprechen? Wir nehmen es auch. Uh, just, um, thank you very much for this um, presentation. Um, how do you start your work progress? Is it is it by invitation to um, uh, by invitation, or is it something you come across in your research? Um, because they're so research heavy projects that you engage with. And then I wanted to ask if you can speak a bit more about the current project that you are doing in Bremerhaven, um, yes. to just to mention it briefly. Yeah, yeah. The first question is really hard to answer because I feel like, um, I think what I figured out now is that I work on this kind of two year cycle. And so like an idea kind of gets planted and then I'm still working on other projects, doing research. And it's um, sometimes a lot of the things that I work on kind of feed into that initial idea and then it just keeps developing. And so because I've done so much research for like the last few years, I, there's just so much to draw upon, which actually can be a challenge at times because it's like, oh, just kind of keeping it narrow. Um, I'll give you an example. So with the um, with the FMI sisters work, the uh, you know that was a commission, and so I was given a criteria, and that was um, uh, to explore the shared war history between Australia and Papua New Guinea. And um, so I thought, okay, well, uh, I just want to focus on Papua New Guinea women and war stories around, around that because there's so, so few. And so I, what I did was in that process was I just focused on women in the archives. And what that did was really pivotal because I actually realised that when I only look for women, I find everyone. Um, the other thing I didn't mention while I was, while I was talking about this was that when I was looking through the Australian War Memorial archives for these women, I found photos of the Unser Deutsch children. They were held in this camp as well. And so you could say, hypothetically, the Unser Deutsch community may not have even survived because they were all children in, in, in this camp and they were there with them. Because they were in the Catholic Church with the Europeans, they all got kind of contained. Anyway, <laughs> side story. But that was really, really important because I realised that just focusing on women, I, I, I find everyone. When you just focus on men, you only see men. When you focus on women, you find everyone. Children, men, women, everyone's there in the archives. Um, and so when I was working on this, uh, um, the, I guess the development phase... I was, I was doing a residency in Helsinki, in Finland, because um, I have Finnish ancestry, believe it or not. Um, my surname is from Finland, Hille. Um, my grandfather was Finnish, and so I was spending time there um, to get to know my roots in Finland. <laughs> and I was surrounded by all of these beautiful flowers in summer. And it was just, I don't know if you got, anyone's been to Helsinki in summer. It's pretty, it's very pretty. They have flowers everywhere <laughs> in front of their shops, in their homes. Like, it's just, it's beautiful. And so I was really 
influenced by seeing flowers and how... Um, and then I started to sort of empathise with the Europeans and the Australian um, civilians who were detained. And I thought, man, that's they, 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 a lot of them became really thin and, you know, very unwell. A lot of people died in that camp. And I just thought, you know, I know when I'm, I'm overseas, like I am right now, like, you know, the longing to be home and to your homelands is like... It, it's, it's something that's, um, you know, that gives you comfort. And I just wondered if a lot of those civilians who were detained for three years were thinking of their homelands and what they would do to just, you know, be back on their home. Um, and so I just started thinking about that and I just thought, well, these women were modest women. So if you know much about Catholic um, religion in terms of um, what Catholic sisters have to do is they take an oath and it's like three things. So it's modesty, obedience, and oh, can someone help me? <laughs> What's the third one? It's like what is the, modesty, obedience, and oh, it's like res, res, refraining from sex. That's what it is. I can't remember the word, for, the English word for it. <laughs> chastity. Thank you. <laughs> modesty, obedience, chastity. So they're the three oaths that Catholic women undertake. Um, uh, getting sidetracked. Yeah. So they were humble women, and so I didn't want to actually create something that was really glamorous and glorifying because they were very modest women. So I thought, well, what could be a gift from the European civilians to these women? And I thought the most humble, modest thing you could give these women were flowers from their homelands, and that's why I chose them. And so I researched all the flowers and had all the names written out, scribbled, and so it was just this process of just like following my intuition and just putting myself in the position of people and just humanising them. Um, and so um, I didn't mention the Australian wattle, <laughs> which is the green and gold. And so um, that's, 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 yeah, it was, I'm always thinking about it in terms of like a human approach and like um, how do I communicate this idea of what I'm thinking to people visually? Like it's just trying to communicate visually. And so... Um, I started with like digital collages with the flowers and, you know, I, I, I actually remade the, um, the, it's called a habit, the scarf. So I got a, I got a fashion designer to remake it, um, including the, um, the, the cinctures. And so we, I spent a lot of time like really understanding everything about these women, what they wore, what they did. Um, I asked a lot of Catholic women a lot of annoying questions. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. They just were just like, you, no more. You need to go and ask someone else. I was like, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so I just really wanted to try and understand what it was like to be a Catholic sister in that situation, but also to really empathise with the people that were held captive. And I thought this was the most beautiful and honourable way to kind of show that history all combined because I could have very easily excluded the Europeans. Very, like, and a lot of a lot of people of colour do. But that's not Papua New Guinea, and that's not what we do. And so that's, that's just not who we are. You know, you go to Papua New Guinea and people will just embrace you. You know, what you hear in the media is just, is just the media stories. And so anyone who says, you know, things about Papua New Guinea, you know, I always ask them, like, well, have you been there? If you haven't, then shut up. <laughs> because I don't want to hear your negative views of my homelands. And so... Um, that's, yeah. It's, and it's just a whole sort of... Um, it's just working through ideas, working through ideas of like, you know, there's a lot of trial and error and like trying to figure things out and what's the best way to sort of do it. And so, you know, and obviously deadlines help <laughs> get the work done. So that was two years, two years, three weeks of research in Rabaul and then research in the archives in Canberra. And then it was like another year of just working through it creatively. And then I came to this, yeah. That was a long answer. <laughs> Thank you so much for this presentation, Lisa. It was wonderful. Um, I was just wondering if I have several questions, but the first one is, you said you found out their names. Did you find out their indigenous, indigenous names as well? Because I, no. those must have been their Catholic assumed exactly. names, right? Exactly. Yeah, they were their yeah. Catholic names. Yeah. But no. Okay. No. So that's, that's, that's a lot more time and research with, 
women. So now that um, Papua New Guinea has opened its borders, like I have a lot of reciprocity trips to do. So I need to go back and talk to that sister and actually give her a lot of images that I found in the archives because I relied heavily on this archivist's work because she she's got a 100-year manuscript because this congregation has now been going for over 100 years. So they celebrated 100 years in 2012 and she's written like the 100-year history, but she hasn't published it yet. And so I said to her, look, I will find a lot of images for you and bring them back because she gave me her knowledge. Like she basically printed out her manuscript and gave it to me. So I relied upon her, her whole like writing. And so, uh, did I answer your question? <laughs> Thank you. And, and just another question also relating to, to uh, Lisa, the other Lisa's uh, question about your recent project. Because you are working a lot about a post-colonial post -colonial perspective, basically, basically on Papua New Guinea. Um, and I was wondering, I mean, maybe you can say a little bit more about that, what you're doing now, the research project. But also, um, I mean, this is something we've talked about before, that this is something that's not very common to do in Papua New Guinea, to have this post critical post-colonial perspective. And I was wondering how this is received in Papua New Guinea itself. So, and, and also relating to that, so that's actually three questions. <laughs> Uh, how you see your role uh, in the context of this project and whether you see your role pa in part as a way of inverting the gaze in terms of Nolde's visit to Papua New Guinea. May maybe a little bit complicated, but... Okay, I'll, I will try my best. Yes, Sorry, I didn't answer your question, Lisa. Um, So the project that I'm affiliated with at the German Maritime Museum is called the Norddeutsche Lloyd Colonial Research Project, North German Lloyds. And so the North German Lloyd Shipping Company was like a major colonial player. And they were the largest, one of the largest shipping companies during the colonial era. And they were largely based in Bremen, Bremerhaven. So... This shipping company was actually um, pivotal in terms of being able to transport the copra that was grown in the Pacific back to Germany, specifically Hamburg. And they also, um, so Governor Hull um, did a deal with them in terms of they had, the NDL financed the, the wharf that was built in Rabaul. And so you can't have uh, uh, production of um, commerce, commerce sort of industries without infrastructure. And so the shipping company, the Norddeutsche Lloyd, actually essentially provided this infrastructure. And it wasn't just for the Pacific, it was all over the world, including Asia, because they had like this kind of quasi-colony in Tsingtao in China, or Hong Kong, I think. And so there were these ships that would often do these routes between like Japan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Sydney, Rabaul, and they just kind of circulated around delivering the mail. And Ships were really pivotal in colonialism. Like, colonies could not have survived without ships. You know, they'd bring in supplies. You know, when you're establishing a colony, there's nothing there. You're starting from scratch. And so they would bring in materials to build houses. But the other thing that I've, I've found, um, which I think is really important and is something I actually want to emphasise, and I'm going to write a blog post on it, <laughs> is um, Captain Karl Nauer. And so I've just come from Obergunsberg which is in Bavaria, and so there's a small South Sea collection that by Karl Nauer, who was a, a, cap a captain of the North, North German Lloyds for quite a few years, and so he did regular trips to Rabaul, and he actually owned a plantation on my homelands, and I, he got someone else. We just figured out that he, he actually got someone else to work on his plantation because he, he, was, he was sailing around the ocean <laughs> delivering, you know, supplies, and so... He collected a substantial uh, collection and he gifted it to this museum. He gifted it to his hometown in Obergunsberg. And so all the way down there is just this incredible collection. And he's also, he also took a lot of photographs. And so he was, he was taught photography by um, scientist Korn, Korn, Leonard Korn. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Who was affiliated with the Ubersee Museum. I think it was a zoologist. And so... Karl Nauer has these photos of like, they're kind of like a touristic, touristic photos of like everyday life in the colony on land and on sea. And that perspective isn't, I've never seen that perspective before. 
And so I was really interested in it because, you know, a lot of the images that I've researched and found in the, in the archives are very much ethnographic, anthropological gaze or missionary kind of work. And it's all very sort of about, you know, this is what we're doing and here's, here's the documentation, here's the success of the colony. Whereas Carl Nauer came in and just took photos of regular stuff. And he also, he took photos of those moments of things where like everyday things were kind of overlooked by the missionaries and the anthropologists. So seeing New Guinea people or Melanesian people unloading the ships when there wasn't a port. He photographed New Guinea people building the roads for the German infrastructure to bring the copra to the shipping port. And that's really important. Like, and a lot of the missionaries and a lot of the colonists do not mention any of this in their journals or their records. It's just kind of like, oh, yes, and now we have a town and we have these beautiful roads and we've built a hospital. And it's like, well, who built the hospital? Who built the roads? You know, and it's actually, it was Melanesian labour. So we did, like, the physical hard work of, like, you know, carrying heavy stuff, you know, really, really, like, arduous work. And then Asians were brought in by the Germans um, to do, like, the skilled work. So they built boats. They built, like, the harbour. Um, and then Europeans essentially just delegated and drank on the verandas and played cards. <laughs> and so it was just like this this hierarchy was already there and so in terms of like what the conclusion I came to was like well they could not the colony could not have existed without our labor without Melanesian labor without Asian labor and so I wanted to look at the movement of Asian and Pacific bodies on German ships because there is a large one of the largest Chinese Papua New Guinea communities exists today in Rabaul and they are known as Sino New Guineans, and they're very much loved. They're very much a part of our community. Um, I grew up in Australia. I was born in Rebel, but grew up predominantly in Australia. And my childhood upbringing was filled with going to Chinese Papua New Guinean family events and German Papua New Guinean events. That was my childhood. <laughs> and I didn't think of anything of it until I, you know, was like, why, why, what's going on here? Why am I calling these people Oma? And why am I eating black forest cake for my 18th birthday? And why am I eating like Chinese fungus for this baptism and red eggs? <laughs> and it was like, this was all to do with German colonialism. You know, like the, one of our former prime ministers of Papua New Guinea, Sir Julius Chan, is Chinese, Papua New Guinean. Like the history is everywhere in terms of like the German colonial history, but it's just never been really looked at, even in Papua New Guinea. That's the fellowship research. There's a lot more going on there. Um, being critical, to answer your second question, um, is initially it's, it's taken me a while to just really kind of stand in that because, you know, I, there's two levels of kind of, uh, what's the word? First of all, I'm a female. <laughs> And then I'm also mixed race, and so I don't have a I don't have a lot of um, I don't have a lot of voice in terms of like, and I live outside of Papua New Guinea, so that's three things. That's kind of like three strikes. I don't live in Papua New Guinea. I'm not like a full blood, and um, yeah, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm female, and so I have to be very careful about what conversations I engage in, and because the. The thing is, like, with colonialism, it's, it's... The colonists have left Papua New Guinea, but the psychology is still there. And so there's, there's racial hierarchy within Papua New Guinea. And so the Unser Deutsch community, when they were there before independence in 1975, um, they were saying... Papua New Guineans were saying to Unser Deutsch communities... Um, uh, I'm probably going to get this wrong, but they said something in Tokpis and, like, time... time in, nah, Time blow me master, now you blah or no got land law here. Basically, they're saying you don't have a place to stay because you're just mixed race. And they had no choice over that. They had no, like, how do you just, how can you discriminate against someone who had no choice about who their parents were or what their lineage? And so there's that. So, but I think. As a woman who lives in Australia, who's able to have these conversations and have this platform today, there's a lot of privilege that I have, and I think it's really important that I really leverage that platform and actually speak 
you know, a lot of these histories because a lot of Papua New Guineans just don't have that opportunity. There's, you know, art is a luxury in Papua New Guinea. Like, it's, to be an artist is a luxury. And so I've had to wrestle with that, but, I, you know, it's, that's, I'm beyond that now. It's just like, okay, no one's doing this work. No one's saying these things. And so if I don't say it, then no one is. And so I've just got to, I've, I have to constantly put my neck out and just, you know, do what I need to do and just hopefully create a legacy that other Papua New Guineans can come through and build upon. Like, that's, that's it. What, what was the third question? Oh, my role on this project... Um, this one, or Kirshner or Nolder, or... <laughs> so I worked with Beatrice for the past year um, on the Kirshner and Nolder exhibition that was at the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, and I was brought in as, I guess, a cultural, I guess, a cultural advisor, I think, um, regarding the New Guinea content of um, Nolder, Ada, and Ada and Emil Nolder going to New Guinea, German New Guinea. And so my, my role in that project, I felt, was to be a voice for in, in a very hyper-local way, even though I don't live in Papua New Guinea, but I was born there. And so it was just to kind of at least give some perspective and insight as to what life was like historically and also contemporarily for Papua New Guinean people. Um, this is where it gets difficult. <laughs> um, I also felt like it was really important that, um, you know, we had, to, you and I had to have really difficult conversations. You know, they weren't pleasant and they were really hard because a lot of those conversations happened over Zoom during the lockdowns and COVIDs. And so it was hard to build a rapport with someone and build that trust um, when you've never met them before in person and... Um, to, you know, challenge and sort of, you know, try and question, you know, your curatorial, uh, you know, vision. Like, that's not easy to do. And it's, I'm feeling really uncomfortable having this conversation in public. <laughs> but I think it's really important to have that openness because not, no one gets to see that. No one gets to sort of see that difficulty and the fact that we had to really wrestle with, you know, narrative. Like, what's the narrative here? are we doing the right thing? Like, you know, like I was questioning the whole time, like, am I making a mistake in terms of like working on this? Like what's going to be the reception? Like it's really risky um, to sort of do work on these projects because it's like, you know, part of me is just like, no, I just want to focus on my people and tell my histories. But then, you know, old history always rears its head and says, hang on, <laughs> you need to address this. And so I... I had no idea that this project was happening until I got an email from people uh, in Copenhagen and then then Amsterdam. And so um, I think my role, most importantly, was just to have to be a part of the conversation. Like, it was just pivotal that I was part of those conversations, like, first and foremost. And so I, I'm really grateful that I got to have that position and, you know, the fact that I... You know, there's so few artists like myself um, who are kind of working in this field. Um, and so I think, I feel like most important, my most important role was just to be part of the conversation and be part of the discussion. And so, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and especially thank you, Lisa, for being so flexible today of not having an interview as we agreed beforehand, but to doing a full presentation. It was very great. And um, thank you for giving us such great insight into your work and practice. Um, and um, as the next event at 5 p.m., there is a performance by Saj Hoyt. We're going to rebuild the stage or the activation area. And thank you very much for coming. And uh, thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you.